welcome to Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Tuesday, February the where are we? 24th? 24th, I February believe. the 24th. In the Memorial Arena in Victoria, BC, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the Shaw staff and our volunteer crew that makes the show happen. It's been another crazy week in the world. Um, the first part of Citizens Forum is always the Walter and Jack show. And Walter, you're going to start off with something about the fact that cell phones and Wi-Fi, I don't even know how to say it, so why don't you just, cell phones and Wi-Fi disturbance in driving is now uh, surpassed drinking and driving as a killer of people. Well, it's, it's uh, now surpassed uh, uh, the drinking and driving as has now become the number one cause for... So what has now become the number one cause? It's the use of cell phones and wireless technology in cars while operating cars. So, uh, you know, uh, I've always been concerned about this issue and followed it for a lot of years. And, and uh, what I'd like to do, actually, from time to time, Jack, is bring in a study that shows, you know, that indicates uh, what sort of problem we are having with, uh, with cell phones. And also looking at the sort of uh, risk factors that we're dealing with for drivers in, in automobiles. So I, I uh, brought in a, a graph for the... Uh, the shot technical staff to put up on the screen for us. And uh, it's going to show a study in 1990, it was done in 1996, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the title of the study is um, The Association Between Cellular Phone Calls and Motor Vehicle Collisions. Now the study is a little dense, a little hard to read, but uh, nevertheless in the study they have tables uh, showing uh, the risk factors of, uh, of using a cell phone while driving. Now the table that's uh, being shown up on the screen is uh, what we show here on the, on the horizontal axis is the minutes uh, preceding of the accident, 5, 10, 15, and 20 minutes preceding the accident. And on the, on the uh, vertical side, we have percent risk. And now we have two, four, and six. Uh, that should be 600%. So what we're looking at here on this graph is uh, something very, very interesting. And that is that all of the drivers depicted on this graph are not actually uh, talking on the phone when the accident occurs. So what, what, what the graph is showing is people make a cell phone call while in their car. They hang up. And sometime over the next 20 minutes, their risk of having an accident has greatly increased. Exactly. To a very high, uh, similar to what you'd be doing if you're drinking and driving. Exactly. So, for instance, uh, if, if you uh, had an accident and you had ta were talking on a cell phone previous to that accident, within five minutes of the accident, your risk factor is four. That means you're four times as likely to have an accident uh, within five minutes of your cell phone call. Now, if it's 10 minutes before the accident, your risk factor is around 2.5. At 15 minutes, yeah. you're still... Now, this is obviously a huge killer. Exactly. I mean, we're talking, it is now a bigger factor than drinking and driving. That's right. And yet, it seems like almost nothing is being done. Uh, here in BC, there's... I mean, it's not all... It, it's, it's definitely killing more people than ISIS. Well, for sure. But the thing is, the, the realize here, I think the, the most stunning thing More about Canadians this, this table ISIS. is that nobody is actually using a cell, cellular telephone when, when the accident occurs. So we're talking about driving while distracted on cell phones, meaning you're talking on the phone. Well, nobody's talking on a cell phone, Jack. Right, right. The phones have all been hung up. Right. <clears throat> and what you're also seeing is a direct dose response relationship that the longer uh, prior to the phone, uh, the accident that you made your call, the lesser of risk. So it, it really does appear that using the phone has done something to brain function. And, and when the brain gets addled, you can't drive a car as well. And it, this sort of a table does indicate very strongly that the brain function is altered by the use of the technology. And, and this is what the public should be aware of, is that, that the radiation from these devices 
does alter brain function. And not only alter brain function, but there are both um, I guess a myriad of short-term and long-term health impacts. I mean, everybody may want to use their cell phone, and everybody, we all are exposed 24-7 now to this sea of radiation coming from Wi-Fi. But we've just got to accept that we're paying a price in, in, in our health, and I have a feeling especially in, in mental health because of this. Well, there's, the ramifications are, are enormous. Uh, particularly if you look at they want to put wireless technology into schools and the industrial strength wireless uh, technology they want to put in schools for wireless internet the rate level of radiation that's being emitted from those devices places everyone in the room at the level of about the same as if they were had a cell phone on and they were talking so you mean when you're in the room or the school yeah it's as if you're on your cell phone 24-7. At the same level that we're showing here in these car accidents. Yeah. We're showing that this is altering brain yeah. function. Now we're placing our children into this type of radiation. And of course children, because their skulls are much thinner, much more vulnerable to other aspects, that they are, their functionality is going to be impaired. And of course over the long term, there are a lot of long term impacts also that are discussed in other studies. You know, it's a uh it's just an absolutely crazy world we live in because, I mean, why? And, and other countries ha are taking steps, I believe, to reduce exposure from, the, including not l allowing it into schools. Am I right? Am I wrong? Well, France is a good example where they've taken uh, Wi-Fi out of all their uh, public libraries. Uh, they banned wireless technology from their kindergartens for children under the age of three. But still, they're taking steps and, and, and in the right direction. Unfortunately, in Canada, we're, we're going in the wrong direction. And uh, our health officials are on the wrong side of this issue for sure. And they're really not looking at the good, solid science. Uh, our administrators in our schools are trusting these health officials, to be honest. Well, I think they have to. I think they, they, if the health official says it's safe, a school official has to go along with it. That, that's Somewhat, but you know, if you actually look at how the, legisl how the guidelines are written, uh, they're, 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 these, are not, these are just guidelines that are suggested by the uh, Ministry of uh, Health and uh, federal government, and they say right in their guidelines that other jurisdictions may choose to adopt our guidelines, so you don't have to. For instance, the city of Toronto has guidelines 100 times stricter than Health Canada's. And, and uh, you know, they have the jurisdiction to do that. We could do that here in, 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 uh, in this region. Uh, the important thing to note, I think, for the administrators to know is that they don't have to follow the, the recommendations of their um, chief medical health officer. And in fact, and I believe they're obligated to go further than that particularly on issues like this when the evidence is so powerful showing that there's harm. And uh, there's no repercussions for doing that. You know, we can take more steps to protect ourselves. In Saanich, in School District 63, they have uh, a, a subtype of a guideline, which is hard to understand, but which they up till recently had banned uh, Wi-Fi from uh, elementary schools, then allowed more in middle schools and in, in high schools. They're now relaxing that rule slightly. And if there's demand for it in any particular school, the administrator can go ahead and put it in. But they recognize that there are m much more issues than what the health authorities are admitting to. Otherwise, they wouldn't have bothered to do it. So we can take our own uh, a stand on our own positions on these things. And school administrators can take more precautions. We are in a situation right now, Jack, where the evidence is so powerful that there is long-term ramifications as well as short-term for harm for children. There's certainly enough evidence to be, take precautions. And why subject these children to this type of radiation? And the rest of us. Exactly. Now, the ramifications of this study, of cell, the cell phone study, is that we should be looking at the, what this really means. We're not talking about distracted driving or dexterity problems. Because they were not on cell These phones. These people are not on, uh, they're not on their phone when they, when they had the accident. And yet, they have a much higher 
chance of having an accident after they've hung up the phone. For instance, in this study, uh, if you're uh, a younger, per younger driver uh, using the same parameters as this graph, your risk of having an accident are 10 times higher in the highest category. Now, these are very high statistics. So what you're looking at North America wide and probably worldwide is hundreds of billions of dollars of insurance claims. How It's the number one cause of accidents exceeding alcohol use. So you can imagine the massive amount of uh, insurance claims that are happening, what we're all paying for. Uh, you can imagine all the death and, and, and injuries and sadness that's coming out of this. And our health officials are stoically not recognizing the And issue. not only the health officials, but where's the media? who pretend to care so much about our health and safety. They're always worried about our health yeah. and safety. And yet here is, here is such a huge killer. And, you know, you say, you know, there's overwhelming evidence of, of the ramifications of Wi-Fi and cell phones, but that's never mentioned in the media. So people don't think about it. And that's the media's job, is to keep these vitally important issues downplayed while you know scaring us with other things right and I just wa I welcome everyone to go online and uh, and you can get this uh, abstract for the study online it's well designed and uh, and uh, you can look for yourself and look at the evidence and there's much more than this by the way there's lots to come um, thank you Walter that uh, you know it's 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 such an important issue and overwhelming that uh, at least the power structure owes people um, a little bit of safety so just you know really start to put the penalties in if, if you're if you're using I mean it's against the law now to use a cell phone in a car um, you know the fine is like 160 bucks or something well you know you're injuring and killing people that, that well, kind of fine. I just will have to point something out in this study they showed that if you're driving hands-free, your risk factors are 1.5 times higher than handheld drivers. That hands-free does not solve the yeah. problem. As and you know, the police fact, knew that. It was the police that got this law put in place because I think they were just sick and tired of having, the police and emergency responders were sick and tired of having to deal with all the death and destruction caused by it. Yeah. But the government still said, yeah, yeah, hands-free is okay. But as you say, the hands-free is equally or more dangerous. It's worse. Now, the, one of the reasons would be is that there's more radiation in the compartment of the car because of the technology. Hands-free technology causes more radiation and uh, uh, more exposure. So it would make sense if we're talking in this. Yeah. And these are important issues, and they just go, you know, you know, the months go by, the years go by, and nothing changes. But meanwhile, Stephen Harper can take us into wars, uh, do whatever he wants. But he, they're bringing in this Bill C-51, which I know nothing about, which is removing, it seems, uh, the protections that people in a civilized society used to have. And uh, that can be done overnight. But, but this kind of stuff, which is killing hundreds and thousands of Canadians... Uh, nothing, nothing is ever done about it. There's, this was in the uh, Times columnist uh, maybe a couple of months ago. It says, doctors call for seniors home care plan. And you know, it was a one-time story never mentioned again. But I'd just like to read a little bit of it. This, uh, this was a few months ago. Um, it was from a meeting, the annual meeting of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. So the annual meeting of the College of Family Physicians of Canada and what they said was this. They issued a report called From Red to Green, From Stop to Go. And it suggested steps for maximizing the health of children and youth, starting with a federal commitment to eliminate child poverty by the end of the decade. Doctors want to see a ban on junk, doctors also want to see a ban on junk food uh, I'm sorry, on junk food advertising directed at children under 12. A step Quebec took in 1980. So since 1980, Quebec has not allowed junk food advertising directed at children under 12. The doctors, this is the College of Family Physicians of Canada. They also want improved nutritional labeling on food products to help parents make healthier dietary choices. 
The college also wants Ottawa to explore tax and subsidy strategies aimed at promoting consumption of healthier foods. The doctors say to reach their full potential, young people need a safe and secure environment, opportunities for physical and mental development, and access to a range of health care resources regardless of socioeconomic status. We know how important early childhood development is to people's long-term success and health outcomes. As physicians, we're constantly having to deal with the consequences of not paying attention to the children as they're growing up. And, you know, this to me seemed to be of such importance. Here the doctors are saying, to reach their potential, young people need a safe and secure environment, opportunities for physical and mental development, and access to a range of healthcare resources. And look where our society is going, especially for poor children, but for all children. Our society is completely out of control, going in the other direction, just throwing junk food and poison at them in every way possible, vaccinating them over and over and over again. You know, we talked about vaccines last week. And, I mean, uh, people have different points of view on, on vaccinations. I, I, and I'm not saying what's right and what's wrong. I'm just saying what we need are the facts. And that's what we never get. The media and our health officials keep telling us it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. But that's not good enough because they've lied to us about so many things over so many years that we can't believe them. So what we need in Canada is just the evidence. Give us the evidence, give us the experts on both sides, let both sides speak to us and then let us make decisions. But we're not getting that. What we're getting is this fear-based, if you, if you don't believe in vaccinations, you're, you're a threat. This is what the media is giving us. The same media, by the way, CTV, for example, which owns Bell Media, which is involved in cell phones, which is killing people by the hundreds, you know, but they pretend they're so concerned about our health when it comes to something else. Anyways. Well, it's business as usual, Jack. Um, having a voice from both sides is, is, a, is a good idea, uh, but in practice, it's very hard to find because really we can't say all research is paid for by corporations but just about all research is done if you go to the university of victoria it's corporate research uh you, you know there's no independent research and uh so finding true experts in in these fields that have a dissenting voice is going to become harder and harder to do you're not going to have a career if you don't have a friendly line towards uh, the corporations that, you know, oversee your industry. So that's a huge problem. You know, and also on the good side of it, I mean, this with these mayors in, uh, in British Columbia, and I think this happened across Canada, they're, they're asking, uh, and the councils are voting on uh, a, a, what would you call, what do you call that when you have a, on a, uh, a bill in, in the in the local pol politicians, you know, it's a recommendation. Uh, I'll find the word in a minute, but basically, where they're saying where where people have the right for a healthy environment. Oh yes, yes, yes. And the right for uh, for safe uh, uh, neighborhoods yeah. and all that. That sounds like flowery lang language in one way, but on the other hand, it shows that yeah, we do have a right. It's not just something to tag on at the end that, that governments have to pay attention to providing safety and, and healthy environment for our children. And meanwhile, going through our parliament, thanks to, well, Mr. Harper is doing it, but Mr. Harper is just the puppet. Um, this new Bill C-51, I, I don't know what it's called. I know nothing about it. it it's the, it's the anti basically uh, what co what can one say it's anti i mean uh, some a lawyer told me years ago these are the laws of nazi germany let's call them that <laughs> let's call them the laws of nazi germany and there's nothing in the media about it i mean uh, i follow the media as best i can and i'm not seeing front page stories about this but harper is pushing it through as fast as he can um and we, how can, how can uh, the prime minister of a democratic nation 
push through a law removing any rights from the people of that country because it's the people that, that this is after on behalf of the corporations. How can the government do that when the people don't even know what the law is? I mean, it's so hard to figure out. But, you know, the thing is that ultimately, remember Pierre Trudeau talked about the just society. And, you know, in a, in a society, we don't have to get into other words about talking about socialism or anything. We can just talk about well, what's fair and what's just. Uh, and, oh, by the way, that costs a little bit of money. Uh, and I think the measurement of, of, uh, of a just society is how we treat the most vulnerable in our society, the, the people who have the, the most needs, uh, that require the most support to get their education, to maintain good health. Uh, we are, uh, measure our society and its enlightenment through how we treat the most vulnerable. And uh, we're moving in the other direction. If you look at the recent budget, uh, Christy Clark's recent budget, was all about giving tax breaks to the to the rich and and uh, cutting back on services for the people who what need them the most. What a pathetic woman! I mean, it is a disgrace that she is the premier of this province. Well, you know, like George Carlin. You know, I just watched, was watching George Carlin the other night on YouTube, and he was talking about uh, everybody's talking about how awful the politicians are. And he says, you know, really, we elected them. We're the ones that decided that they were the, going to be the. Our yeah, leaders. but I saw another one where he said, "I didn't vote, and I'm not taking any blame." And that's me. I didn't <laughs> vote, and I'm not taking any blame. Walter, thank you very much. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Jack. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. This is segment two of Citizens Forum, being filmed on Tuesday, February the twenty fourth, two thousand and fifteen. Our guest in this segment is Linda Tafts. Uh, Linda is a video, a videographer and peace activist, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. And you went to Palestine in December, which mm -hmm. I think is a very brave thing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so, question number one: Why did you go? Well, um, I heard about this group that was going. It's um, Canadian Friends of Sibyl. Canadian Friends of? Cra Canadian Friends of Sabeel. And Sabeel is a um, group that was started in Jerusalem by Protestants in Jerusalem. And I thought I would go with my camera to videotape the um, peace groups that they were going to be talking to, Israeli and Palestinian. Because I thought that, you know, you hear so much on the news about um, all the bad things that are going on. I wanted to go and find out some good things that are happening there. And this particular group, Canadian Friends of Sabeel, were going um, to meet with Israeli and Palestinians that were working on this issue. What did you learn? <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> and I met with so many groups. I was only there for 10 days. and. In those 10 days, I met with 20 different groups. I vide videoed um, about 25 different speakers. But there were so many um, admirable people that are really working for peace. For example, um, I met with Arik Asherman. He's with Rabbis for Human Rights, and he calls himself a Zionist. But he said his reading of the Torah is that whatever he wants for himself, he has to want for other people. So he has to, according to his reading of the Torah, work for peace and justice for the Palestinians. And for that, he's gone to jail many times. Then they also met with um, Mazen Kim Seye, who was a Palestinian, but he was looking at the bigger picture. Excuse me. Mm. Yeah, he was looking at the bigger picture of, you know, the, there has always been some time immemorial Jews and Palestinians, Palestinians living in that area. And it wasn't until the late 1800s when the Zionists came and said, this is a Zionist colony, that there was problems. But he says, 
throughout history, different groups have tried to come in and colonize the area, and they haven't been able to because it's multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural. So they, he feels that the Zionist um, experiment, he called it, will fail. And then I met with, um, um, what's his name, Jeff, Jeff Helper. Oh, yeah. He's with, he's, well, he founded an uh, Israeli group called Israelis Against House Dem Demolitions. And so he was working um, with this group to try and prevent Israelis' house being demolished because it's very difficult for Palestinians to get a permit to build a house. So because they don't have a permit, Israelis come and bulldoze it. And it's been like that since about oh. 1948. It's a mess there. It, it, it is. is a mess. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, you met good people trying to do good things, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm sure it's uh, almost an overwhelming. Well, I found that people on both sides were depressed. And I also found that most Israelis are against the occupation. And they're working um, either... Now when you say the occupation, that means... That means um, in, Palis in the Palestinian areas, which they call the West Bank and Gaza, it's basically a military occupation. There's about five million Palestinians that are under occupation. And the settlers are moving into those areas, and it's the military's mandate to protect the settlers. So but they you say that most Israelis are not supportive of that. They're not. And, and in particular, I met one um, Israeli, she's Refusenik, who that, that means she refused to go into military service. But she said that Israelis are taught from childhood, from when they're very small, that everyone in the world wants to kill them just because they're a Jew. That is reinforced in school. So when they get to maybe grade 11, they have these um, military fairs. Not are you going into the military or not, but which division are you going to go into? It's just like because they feel that everyone in the world has been protect. I mean, sorry, all the all the other Israelis have protected them. So when they get to be 18, it's time for them to to go into the military and protect the um, the, rest the other of the society. Rest of society. So it's a very militarized society. And um, Sahar talks about who benefits that. So I brought in this video clip for you to see her words of how she is benefiting from this um, situation. Okay. So um, let's, let's have a look at that video. It's about four minutes long. The other side of it is, again, understanding who's actually profiting out of this. And then we have to go back to these very nice generals. Um, and probably the best example for this is Barak, our ex-chief of staff, minister of defense, prime minister. Um, who just, is, it's just a, a cute example. So when he was Minister of Defense uh, in, in the last, uh, the previous government, um, he was in the process of uh, privatizing uh, IMI, Israeli military industry. It's the biggest Israeli military industry company in Israel. Um, he was in the process of privatizing it. He thought he was about to retire, he pa and, and he was privatizing it, um, and then he, uh, political things changed, so he didn't retire, so he paused the privatization until he retired. Retired, it's being privatized now, and he is in the bid together with another uh, business colleague to buy it. Okay, so, I mean, it's pretty much out there. There's a whole lot of people, most of them ex-generals, um, who have the, the, the in in the military, um, so they obviously, they have the expertise, they have the connections, um, they have the, the effect that they have on the political system is extremely strong, and they can make a huge economic profit out of that. Today, 75 to 80 percent of Israel's military industry is for export. It's not about defense of Israel. It's about the bottom line. Um, Israel today is in the 
top 10 biggest weapons exporters in the world. It's the number one weapon exporter per capita in the world. It's now the number one drone exporter in the world. And we're talking about a huge, huge industry, um, which also has, you know, it's, it's then Israel is, is the, I think, fourth biggest uh, um, uh, military spender in percentage of GDP, 6.2% of our GDP, something like that. The U.S. is 4.4. I don't remember the U.K., but the world average is 1.8. Uh, no, sorry. The world average is, is 2.5. The NATO average is 1.8. Um, so it's, it's a lot of spending, but mostly it's just a lot of money coming in. And the reason that Israel can do that is that we, we can prove our weapons work, unlike a lot of other countries, because they're combat proven. Um, I don't know how many of you in your spare time look at commercials for weapons. I assume not many. I do. Um, but you'll actually see in posters, so you'll have like a, a poster for a drone, um, and, and I'm not kidding, <laughs> you have posters for drones, um, and it has a stamp that says battle proven. Yeah. That's how you market things. And so in the last attack on Gaza, there were over 20 uh, different weapon uh, systems, um, including missiles, new drones, um, protective systems, a lot of different things that were, had their first operational debut during the summer and are now being sold in, in September, so a month, not even a month, after the operation ended, there was a huge um, military export uh, expo of drones in, near the, the airport. Um, that, that That's what they sell. And countries are very happy to buy that, and it's important to say that it's countries, especially the U.S., and I'm sure this is also true of the UK, but most of the examples I know are from the US, are also happy to use that angle of Israel. Um, I just want to make the point, this is, this is a, a very um, two-sided game. So this is a little bit about the, the profit side of how this whole system works. Um, but if you want Israelis to never question that, to never think about that, one of the best things you can possibly do is, I mean, make them join you. Today, if you criticize the Israeli military, if you criticize the occupation, you're criticizing yourself, what you did as an 18-year-old kid, what your parents did, what your siblings do, what your best friend is doing. You can't do that. It's, it's almost a psychological mechanism that prevents us from being able to actually criticize what's happening around us because we're doing it. Uh, thanks. Linda, do you want to say anything about the video that people have just seen? Well, I, I think that it's pretty self-explanatory, um, but I would like to talk about what Canadians can do, because that every group said basically the same thing. One, they had the slogan, come and see. They really want people to go there, to have a look. Um, one, so they don't feel isolated. Uh, two, um, so that you get their perspective because uh, Israel has all the mechanisms. They have the control of the, the media so they can get their word out. And so Palestinians want you to come and find out for yourself exactly what's going on. And of course, three, there's the tourist dollars. My trip was um, a particularly intense political trip, but there are a variety of trips that you could go on. And if um, people wanted to Google alternative tourism group, ATG, you can find out a whole list of different tours that they could go on. The second thing people were asking for was to support boycott, I'm sorry, boycott, divestment and sanctions. Um, and if people want to know more about that, they could um, Google Jewish Voices for Peace. And there's a whole lot on their website about what to boycott. Yeah, and that's basically a worldwide movement to it put is. economic pressure on, on Israel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was there anything else? Well, the third thing was, um, which is probably the most difficult, is to put pressure on our own government to stop supporting Israel. Because we spend a lot of, we send a lot of money. Um, unfortunately, this particular government thinks that Israel is Canada's best friend. You know, it, it's really, I mean, I think that Harper's position on, on Israel is 
I mean, it's corrupt and disgraceful because I don't think it reflects what Canadians really think. I don't know what Canadians really think, but we should know, and our government's policy should be based on that. And, and I don't think the people of Canada want Stephen Harper saying we're, we're Israel's best friend. I mean, I don't think that's quite where Canadians are. I think Canadians see that Israel has a lot to answer for and what it's been doing over the years and that there is a peace there. There's definitely a peace there and, and Israel is a big part of the problem and pressure should be put on them to come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. Which and, the, yeah. they're hoping the boycott, divestment and sanctions will do. But our government is also very intertwined with Israel's government. A few years back they signed a free trade agreement about eight years ago. They had security agreements, and then just recently, maybe just a couple of weeks ago, they signed a memorandum of, of um, agreement, a mem mem some, which was very um, vaguely worded, but basically it's, we will protect your country and each other's country, and their security is coming in here. They, they come in and train our police. 31 of our chief of police went over to Israel to be trained. They sent police. Or they sent the military over to train the Vancouver police for the Olympics. They're in helping to run our prison systems. Israeli. Israeli military. Well, it's funny you've never heard of that. I know. Yeah. 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 And again, that's the role of the media to make yeah. sure we don't hear mm -hmm. of these very important that's things. That's right. Yeah. Jeff Halper, who was um, the Israeli that I met in Jerusalem, was on Vancouver Island just last week. And he was, he was talking about this, Canada's involvement with Israel and how they're bringing in the security and, and just linking it. Yeah. Um, when you were there, so you were in, I guess, villages and towns and cities in Palestine for a couple of weeks, 10 days? 10 days. Yeah, so what, yeah. what's... Uh, how are the people doing there? What's, what's the feeling that you get? What, what's your impression? I, I thought that... Um, what's it like to live there? Oh, well, if you live um, in Tel Aviv, you don't even know what's going on. You don't have to know what's going on. But if you live in Bethlehem, where it's like a prison, the Israeli law says that Jews can't go into Bethlehem. And for people of Bethlehem who want to leave, they have to have a permit. For example, we had a tour guide he had a permit, he could take us around, but he wasn't allowed to take out his wife or children. So they live in Bethlehem. They live in Bethlehem. But they can't leave Bethlehem. They can't leave Bethlehem. They're, they're Palestinian. That's Palestinian, Palestinians in Bethlehem. But you as a tourist could go in and have a tour. Yes, yeah. yes. And I guess maybe once a year, does his family get to go out or He's why not? not? He cannot take them out. He cannot take them to Jerusalem. He cannot take them to the beach. So he feels depressed. And that was my feeling of the general sense of the population. Depression. Israelis and Palestinians that I met with were working on this issue. You know, and if you go back, I don't know what the, I don't I don't know what the big picture is, but if you go back, you almost get the feeling that part of the whole World War II experience, you know, when you know that corporate America was funding Hitler from the beginning to get him started then you think part of the whole experience obviously was to push the Jews into Palestine to create uh, some kind of a force there that the Western powers could use to you know destabilize the oil region as best they could I mean that's and there's no you know it, it's crazy but I think that's kind of what happened and all the people who are there are suffering for it and it would be nice if 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 that if things were done a bit differently and they still can be starting tomorrow and start trying to solve the problem mm -hmm. instead of making the problems mm -hmm. worse. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I I uh, you know, we should all appreciate the people who are who are doing what you've done, which is to try to not only go over there and, and give a bit of support to the people who are there, I'm sure who need support, mm -hmm. but also to put pressure on our own politicians here to do something so should people contact their MPs and yes yeah. contact their MPs write letters just be more informed um, I'm as I told you I videotaped about 25 different speakers 
And so I'm slowly putting those videos on our website, which um, is www.pacific.ca. And Pacific is P-A-S-I-K yes. yes. Linda, thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you for having me. And thanks for watching this episode of Citizens Forum. Welcome to the last segment of Citizens Forum being filmed on Tuesday, February 24th, 2015. I'd like to thank again the Shaw staff and our volunteer crew that makes this show happen. Our guest in this segment is Chris Cook. Chris, you've been on uh, many times before. Yeah, you guys are getting used to me, I guess. And we've got a lot to talk about, so let's start yeah. with uh, let's start with Haiti. Well, an it's the anniversary is coming up, Jack. It's the eleventh anniversary uh, at the end of this month of the coup that overthrew the uh, wildly popular president uh, Jean Bertrand Aristide in two thousand and four. Oh. Canada was complicit in that, by the way, and the Americans and uh, France. When you say the wildly popular, are you being facetious or telling? No, the truth? no. I'm. He was elected. He was the most popular democratically elected leader in all of the Americas, by far. His approval rating was like 90-something percent at the time of the coup. Uh, he was a former priest, a populist. Uh, he suffered all kinds of, uh, um, well, he, he was the victim of a previous coup as well. Um, so every time this guy got back into power, the military would move in because he, he had the audacity, the temerity to offer some relief to Haiti's impoverished, which you know, it's one of the poorest countries in the Organization of American States. So the democratically, the democratically elected president of right. Haiti was overthrown in a coup run by the United States with Canadian And assistance. France. Canada, uh, well, and actually the Americans, uh, they did some of the heavy lifting, but it was really Canada and the French that, that did all the planning. And they went in there in the dead of night and whisked him out of his room in his, you know, in his pajamas and slippers and put him on an airplane off to Africa to, to, the, uh, uh, to the Congo, you know, before he knew what had happened. You know, it was incredible, too, though. They didn't take his cell phone. So he actually did a live interview, if you can believe this, from the airplane with Amy Goodman saying, I'm being kidnapped, <laughs> <laughs> and these are who's kidnapping me. And it actually saved him to some degree. So again, this is the president of Haiti, 11 years ago, did you say? Yeah, the anniversary will be, well, the 29th of February. Or Who were the ones that actually kidnapped him? Well, the Canadian military, like the JTF2 guys, the commando types, they secured the airport. That was their job. The American equivalent, Navy SEALs or Marines, I'm not sure which, but their military guys actually went into the presidential palace, aided by uh, their friends in the... Uh, in the Haitian military and police as well. And they actually did the deed and, and bagged them and dragged them off. Yeah. So again, uh, uh, this is the way the world really works. Uh, Canada complicit in the overthrow of a popular democratically elected leader. And complicit after the fact in propping up the, the, the thuggish regime that took over for him. You know, uh, uh, Martelli is still the, the uh, president now and he uh, just, uh, I don't know, a few months ago, he just decided that the parliament was a, an, a, an encumbrance to him and just chucked it out. I mean, you know, talk about proroguing, man. This guy, yeah. he prorogues with a vengeance. <laughs> you're, you're not coming back, you know, yeah. and, and so they haven't come back. And, you know, the, the elections are already a year overdue. Like, you know, it's like, well, we don't need elections and we don't need a parliament. We got me. I can me. just see Stephen taking notes here. Well, I mean, you know, Harper government has been a big supporter of Haiti. They, uh, with your money and mine, they offered training of the police with the RCMP, millions of dollars for the, the faux election that brought Martelli in in the first place. Loads of, of irregularities. I mean, just, you know, forget about it. They even outlawed the biggest party, the, the FAMI party that was Aristide's party, weren't even allowed to run any candidates. They're the most popular party in the country. It's like not allowing Justin Trudeau or I don't know who's popular here nowadays, but, you know, yeah. I mean, it's a joke. But uh, time and again, you know, the Harper government, you know, they're big friends with Honduras, another coup government. They're big friends with Egypt, another coup government. You know, uh, democracy is pretty low on the agenda in this country nowadays. And now we're seeing it come home to roost with these uh, C-51 that you and uh, uh, Walt were talking about. You know, I think that's the biggest problem is that, you know, we're watching 
and talking about democracy being destroyed in other countries. They're going to do it here too. And Harper is just the puppet. It's the corporations, folks. I think a lot of us know that, but there's nothing we can do about it. But at least we've got to know and we've got to focus our attention and our anger on, on the real threat. The real threat to us is exactly what, what Chris is talking about here. And it's got nothing to do with ISIS and these, these false flag operations that Canada and the United States are putting on. And, you know, out of all that, you know, the, the U.S. funding ISIS, the U.S. creating ISIS, now because of ISIS, which they run, we're getting Bill C-51. And well, you know, they, they deny that. The government says, no, this, this was all in the, in, the, in the works for a long time. It's just a coincidence that we put it together after these attacks in Quebec and Ottawa where these two servicemen were attacked. But, um, and a lot of questions about, about what really happened in those murders. We have no idea of the truth of what happened in Ottawa and in Quebec over those few days. Um, I, I believe it, 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 the, the real story has little to do with what we've been told. You know, for example, the, the first killing was, was the killing of a soldier in uh, south of Montreal. He was run over, um, and then the attacker uh, uh, escaped by car, was chased by the police. Um, his car flipped over in a ditch. Uh, you know, on the highway, so there's lots of people around. He supposedly, the first story say he came out with his hands in the air trying to surrender and was gunned down by the police. So the question is why, if he had his hands in the air, was he killed by the police? And because then there's no questions can be asked of what was really going on. And there's well, just as many questions about the killing in Ottawa as well. Well, it's a good argument for the, the wearable cameras that seem to be growing in popularity for police in the States, and, and it will probably come up here as well. I mean, there's always a reason, you know, for these draconian measures wherever we've seen them historically. You know, I was in a waiting room the other day, and, and one of my fellow waitees came in uh, uh, with a Rottweiler, and there was a young child in the waiting room, and she was asking innocently what happened to the Rottweiler's tail. And the guy that was with the dog explained how they put an elastic band around the tail, you know, when it's a pup, and it doesn't hurt, he reassured. And the blood gets cut off, and over time, it just falls off as a useless appendage, right? Well, this is kind of the way we're treated, too, and it's going to be our democracy that's going to be this useless appendage that when it falls off, we'll hardly miss it. Yeah, because basically it's, it's just about gone. Well, know? it's bloodless, you know, and I mean, right now at Victoria, after the airing of this, uh, the first airing of this program, there's going to be a meeting the NDP's holding at the local church here to talk about C-51, and and, and I went, uh, this is the Anti-Terrorism Bill, uh, uh, Anti-Terrorism Act, I think it's officially called, but uh, C-51 and C-54, it's companion. Um, I looked at the voting, they went through second reading in the House this week, and uh, so it's not law yet, it has to go through the process, but it, it sailed through because the majority government you know, made it so. But I, it, I saw a breakdown of who voted for it, and, and all the parties voted as blocks. So the Conservatives and the Liberals voted to, to a member in support of carrying this bill forward. The NDP to a, to a member voted against. Uh, the three, I think it is Independents, and the two Greens also voted against it as well. I mean, which is kind of disheartening to see, even if they're voting against it, everyone has to vote, you know, toe the party line, which I don't think is a very democratic uh, uh, situation for the country no, to begin not. with. But the NDP, the, f the official opposition, are going to try and make an issue out of it. And our local NDP member here, uh, uh, Murray Rankin, is, is chairing this meeting at the local church here to, you know, to talk about it. Because a lot of people are worried about this legislation. Four former prime ministers have already spoken out against it. Who? Which prime ministers? Oh, yeah, my God, you, know. you got me on the spot. Oh, okay. uh, Joe Clark is one of them. Okay. Uh, who else is there that's still alive? Yeah, who were our <laughs> prime ministers, yeah. Yeah. Jean Chrétien? Uh, Chrétien. Uh, Joe Clark. Well, uh, Clark. Combinations. And, uh, and I think some uh, retired judges as well. There is, there's a lot of opposition, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't understand how in a country that pretends to be a democracy, but which really isn't, how somebody like Harper can put through a bill taking away our rights. And we don't even know what rights are being taken away. I have no idea what's in Bill C-51. Um, Sixty-something pages long. How, how they can pass laws when the people of the country don't even know what the laws are, and yet 
they're directly impacting us. Uh, years ago, shortly after 9-11, uh, a lawyer said, what's coming, in, what's coming into being are the laws of Nazi Germany? And I think, you know, slowly but surely, um, that's the direction uh, we're being moved in. Be and, you know, for, on, uh, for whose benefit? For whose benefit? Well, now the other two places too, Jack. I mean, uh, uh, speaking of democracy denied, uh, uh, in the Ukraine, that's another coup government that our our government uh, supports. Fully that supports. The deputy finance minister is actually in Ottawa this week and talking to the government, our government, uh, about military aid. The president, uh, Poroshenko, was in uh, Abu Dhabi yesterday at an arms fair, you know, talking to the, the main American procurement officer and trying to get a deal going, you know, trying to go around, you know, uh, any way possible to keep this hot war going there, you know. These guys, they started shooting up a, a square, chased the president right out of the Capitol, the duly elected president, who'd already said he'd shorten his term and everything, you know, he'd done everything he could. And yet if you listen, like I listen to CFAX a, a fair bit, and if you listen to CFAX, um, it's always the drumbeat of Putin is the enemy. Putin oh, yeah, is, is, yeah. is the, the problem. The next Hitler, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, there's this message being told to us that the Russians are the bad guys. And, and, but I don't believe the message, and I, I don't think anybody should. Um, we can't trust our own prime minister. We can't trust our own government. We certainly can't trust our own media. I don't pretend to know what's going on there or who the good guys and bad guys are and I'm sure it's the mix as always, but we certainly should not believe what we're being told. It's very, very dangerous to believe what we're being told. Well, well and when, we, when everybody agrees in the media about whatever issue it is, that's when you gotta really prick up your ears. You know, when everyone is, is on the same page about a message, you know, you see that uh, there's the fix is in here, you know, there's no nuance to it, right? I mean, there was in Minsk a, a couple of weeks ago, they had a, the ceasefire talks, right? The second time, the first one sort of fell apart. These ones haven't taken hold either just yet. And, I, you know, it's not a real big surprise why, because the, the one of the parties isn't at the table. I mean, the Americans were there. The European Union was there. Poroshenko and the coup government from Kiev, they were there. Who wasn't there? Well, the guys that they keep calling the, the Russian-aided separatists, they didn't even have a seat at the table. You know, Putin was there, but they weren't. So, I mean, you, and you see this in Palestine as well, where there's no representation from the people that are actually there, you know. From Gaza, you might have some puppet like Abu Mazen or something, you know, in there. But you're never going to have, uh, you know, real representation. You're not going to be able to solve an issue without getting all parties involved to the table. And they, they refuse to do it. Yeah, and, um, you know, you mentioned the shooting in the square. And I think... Yeah, the Maidan, yeah. Yeah, that was basically the spark that blew things up there. And... Uh, I mean, it, it's what is done now around the world. Uh, somebody goes in and starts shooting people on both sides. Yeah, these snipers things. It's interesting to see snipers are now being, you know, uh, raised into these right. great heroes as well, you know, where we saw the sniper attacks way back when in, in Thailand during the colored revolution there, you know. Yes. We've seen them in other places too. All of a sudden, people's heads get getting blown off, and they shoot people on both sides as they did in, in, uh, in, in Kiev. Yes. Yes. Um, so just, I mean, just don't, we can't believe the media. That's, I, I don't know what is going on in any of these situations, but what we're being told, believe me, the media does not care about the interests of the people of Canada. The media cares about the interests of corporate Canada and the world's corporations, and they'll do anything to us. Well, and look at Greece, right? When you talk about the corporate rule, like it, it's not even been a month since this government in Greece was elected. Again, with an overwhelming majority, 70% support for their anti this so-called austerity program, right? 70% of the people said, no, we, we can't have it. They've been had it for five years. They were promised, okay, short-term pain, long-term gain, you know, the old song. They're worse off now. It's like a Great Depression there. Their, their unemployment rates are, have skyrocketed. I mean, people are eating out of dumpsters. I mean, it, it's, it couldn't get much worse, and the people said, no, we can't take it anymore. They brought in a coalition government that said it would stop it. Well, now they're starting to waver already because the weight of the international media and the, the Eurozone, they're not getting any help from anyone else, you know, because this is the corporate agenda. The, the, the SAP program the strate that we saw back in the 80s, you know, being visited on the South Americans, 
you know, these, um, uh, they just ruin economies and make of these people indentured slaves trying to service a debt that can never be paid for, uh, you know, forever. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, the country, they loot all of your resources and, and everything else. And uh, my, uh, my understanding is that Greece is being privatized. What the government owned, including land, is being bought up by the privateers. Well, sure, uh, pennies on the dollar, too. I mean, there's been talking, you know, Greg Pallas, uh, the great American journalist and economist, you know, he says he can't believe it. Why are you trying to stay in the Eurozone? He asks the, the, the Greek, the new Greek government, dump it and begin a new, a new drachma, a new currency, get away from these guys, because, I mean, it's a sinking ship. But these, stru these structural adjustment programs, is what they used to be called, or austerity as it's called now, I mean, don't you worry, you'll see it from a much closer vantage point soon because it, it's all coming our way. This is going to come and what we're going to start seeing ourselves structurally adjusted as well one of these days soon. And in fact, we already are. I mean, more and more people are being pushed out the bottom and left to fend for themselves while Christy Clark uh, uses her power to take care of herself and uh, give tax breaks to the people at the top and sell out our province and where necessary poison the province with fracking and everything else and and somehow she I, I really don't understand how she's the premier of this province it just I mean don't you have to have some interest in in the province itself can you just work directly for the corporations and sell the people out on every issue well, she has a lot of interest in some of the province that sort of razor thin one percent that's really doing well and she's you know, personable enough to sell it, for sure. I mean, you look in, in Britain, though, it's the same thing. Everywhere you look, it's the same thing, the frackers and the corporados and everything else. They've got a term that they call the precariat, which are the, the people living on the most, the most of the people, right? The 99%. The yeah. precariat. You know, they, they live precarious lives, a paycheck or two away from utter devastation, and the government supports are falling away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, but we can do better. We can do better. Um, I don't know how to move us from here to there. Um, certainly we need more democracy and we need a free press. I mean, we need the free press to inform people about what's really going on, not just the corporate message, but, uh, but other messages as well. And you have to support the free press. So go yeah. get out there and show them that you're listening. You know, we're having our fun drive at CFUV Radio, you know, in March. You know, come out, give us a few bucks, give us your love more than your money, though. You know, let us know that you're listening to alternative messages. You know, that really keeps people like me going. You know, it's been 16 years of doing radio, yeah. you know, and... and what, does community radio get money from somewhere? Yes, we get money from several sources at CFUV. Um, there is a new fund, a, a new federal fund. I don't, don't ask me the ins and outs of it, but some of our funding comes from the Student Society, the bulk of it, at the University okay, of Victoria. Okay. The fund drive accounts for a percentage of it, maybe 15 or so. We need more community radio, and Chris, we're out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and folks, uh, yeah, I don't know what we can do, but thank you for watching <laughs> Citizens Forum this week. Ha, ha, ha.